Amen. <clears throat> we come now to the third piece of the armor that God has graced us with so that we might walk in victory in this spiritual warfare. And we want to read again in verse 14 and 15. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, we may be tempted to think that the soldier's feet is relatively unimportant as compared to this belt of truth and this breastplate of righteousness, but uh, nothing could be further from the thr truth. Because when Paul uses the word feet, he's reminding us that every compartment of the walk of a born-again life of the follower of Jesus Christ is involved in this spiritual warfare. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9, he said, We have as our ambition, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to God. He writes to the church at Colossae and says, Whatever you do in word or in deed, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not men. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. So our walk with the Lord involves the entirety of our life. Thus this spiritual warfare with the powers of darkness involves every compartment of our life. Earlier in this epistle to the church at Ephesus, Paul says in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, I therefore, as the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now remember, those first three chapters to the letter of the church at Ephesus describe all the spiritual wealth that is ours in union with the Lord Jesus. But that wealth must be appropriated. It must be practically applied in our spiritual walk and in our spiritual warfare. We must not neglect any compartment. In other words, our commander is calling on us to walk and war in a manner that is well-pleasing to him. And he's praying that we would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. And being fruitful unto every good work. Now, with that little introduction to this section in our mind, let's think for a moment, as we have with the other two pieces of the armor, about this historical analogy of the Roman soldier's boots. Now, one of the most important pieces of a Roman soldier's battle gear, his equipment, was his footwear. Uh, he could have his breastplate on, he could have his robe girded up, but without the proper shoes, the soldier may not even arrive at the battlefront. And even if he did arrive, even if he made it with his fellow soldiers, he'd be lacking the proper footwear to enable him to stand his ground in stability and to advance with mobility. If he didn't have the proper shoes, he had no hope for victory. He could be wounded in his feet. He'd be incapacitated in the midst of the battle. He'd become easy prey for his enemy. Consequently, every Roman soldier needed to be enabled to travel swiftly to the battlefield and to stand strong in the battle so his footwear was an essential part of his weaponry. Now, his boots are called caliga. 
Uh, they're kind of similar. You've seen pictures of them, the leather sandals, but with straps strapped up all the way, all the way close to his knee. Those straps were bound tightly around his legs, and that gave him stability. Now, that was the name of them, Caliga. They were very thick soles on these sandals. Because as a Roman soldier was going to battle, the enemy would set dangerous traps in the ground just underneath the surface of the soil. There would be spikes sticking up out of the ground. And if a soldier didn't have these thick soles and he stepped on one of those sharpened sticks or spikes, it would pierce his feet and put him out of action. Now, not only did they have these thick soles, but they also had what we would call similar uh, to cleats that dug into the ground, and that gave him the appropriate mobility to move swiftly to the battle and the stability to stand firm in face-to-face -face combat. And these specific boots designed for the Roman soldier made that army the most dreaded and dominating army of that era. Now that brings us to the spiritual application of the Christian soldier's boots. What, what does uh, the word of God say? Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now it's not difficult to interpret and apply the phrase the gospel of peace, but the key word to understand here in this piece of the armor is the word preparation. And that word preparation actually has two applications. We'll spend a little time on one application, then we'll move to the second application in a little while. First of all, the first application of this word preparation teaches every Christian soldier that it is the gospel of peace that gives us stability. That gives the Christian soldier security. It's the gospel of peace that gives every born-again follower of Jesus a firm footing to fight the good fight of faith. It gives us the stability, the Christian soldier, as we read last night, to stand and to withstand the assaults of our mortal enemy. Just as these Roman soldiers' boots gave him great confidence in the physical conflict, it is the stability and the security of the gospel of peace that is even more vital to you and I. Amen? It is the glorious gospel of peace that is our only firm foundation from which you and I can fight the good fight of faith with victory. The adversary is seeking to attack your confident assurance in the gospel. For he knows if he can attack your security, your stability, he can hinder you and obstruct you in your devotion to Christ and your determination to follow the Lord Jesus. I remind you that Satan and his minions hate the born-again follower of Jesus who is demonstrating a deep desire and a devoted determination to the Lord. He despises a disciple who is walking with Jesus in the way of righteousness and holiness. He absolutely can't stand the born-again follower of Jesus who is purposing to fulfill the Great Commission. He has a profound antagonism for any soldier who is bearing much fruit for the glory of God. And he has sinister ambitions to debilitate your testimony, to ruin your testimony, to incapacitate you so that you will rob the Lord of the glory 
that the Lord is due in your life. And he'll deploy anything he can from his wicked uh, 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 arsenal to debilitate your worship to hinder your walk with the Lord, to oppose your work with the Lord, and to spoil your fruit for the glory of the Lord. He'll tempt you to become proud of your victories. He'll tempt you to become overly discouraged in your spiritual setbacks. He'll employ any scheme, any strategy that he can to orchestrate defeat and disgrace in the life of a soldier of the army of the Lord. So we must be prepared to march into the battle. We must be equipped to be able to stand firm with stability. We must be equipped with the proper shoes. If we're going to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen? And what are these glorious boots that the commander has provided for us? He says, and we'll come here for a moment. He says, those boots are this little phrase, the gospel of peace. Oh, dear brothers and sisters, our victorious commander has constructed some boots for us that are absolutely marvelous that are made from the most excellent material. For these boots are the glorious good news of the gospel of peace, and there can be no greater blessing than the boots of the gospel. Because the truth of the gospel of peace alone can transform you, who were once an enemy of God, into one who has peace with God. Amen? The gospel of peace is reminding us of the precious peace which was grace to us when we entered into a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ through repentance of sin and saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to Romans 5 and verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have justification through penitent faith in the Lord Jesus before our conversion. You may not have known it. You may have been on a bar stool. You may have been on a church pew. But before your conversion, you were at war with God. Whether you knew it or not, whether you realize it or not, you were living in treasonous rebellion against God. Our minds were at enmity with God. We were like wandering sheep going astray, wandering down paths of wicked sinfulness and willful selfishness. And I'll tell you what, friends, if the good shepherd didn't come after me and apply the gospel to me in power, I would have kept on wandering until I wandered into hell itself. And so would you. Whether you were in a nightclub or in a Baptist church, The wandering sheep lives a life of rebellion against God. And so there's no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. Because before conversion, we're living under the tyranny of sin. And the great enemy of peace is sin. And we were without peace with God because we were without the righteousness of God. And before the miracle of the new birth, we were existing in a condition of being both accursed and condemned by God. Oh, but the Prince of Peace came to make peace between holy God 
and wicked sinners like me who deserve the unmitigated wrath of God. Amen? And the Prince of Peace came, and he perfectly pleased the Father in every way. The Father kept saying from heaven, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He perfectly obeyed the law of God, the will of God, the plan of God, and then he voluntarily marched up to the cross and presented himself to the Father, not only as the great high priest, but as the Lamb of God, not only as the offerer of the sacrifice, but the very offering himself. And we've already heard in that first session that in those three hours of miraculous darkness, God the Father plunged the knife of his undiluted wrath, the very equivalent of an eternity in hell, into the heart of the Prince of Peace, in the place of, and on behalf of any sinner and every sinner who will come to the Prince of Peace on his terms. Amen? Now, it is true that the sufferings of unconverted sinners in hell is infinitely extensive because it's going to last for all eternity. But the three hours of the Lamb of God's suffering at Calvary was infinitely intensive because he paid the full price for all the sins of every sinner who will surrender to the Prince of Peace on his terms. He, he was pierced for the transgressions of. He was crushed for the iniquities of. Any and every sinner who will repent and believe the gospel, the punishment that we deserve fell on him that we might have peace. Therefore, it's no coincidence that the boots of peace follow the breastplate of righteousness. Because the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 32, 17, the work of righteousness will be peace. The prophet Isaiah, uh, no, excuse me, the psalmist said in Psalms 85, listen to this, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And it happened on the cross of Jesus. God's gift of imputed righteousness produced a reconciliation for an enemy like me with a holy God. Amen? And the only way that any sinner can know authentic peace is to be justified in the sight of God. The only grounds through which a sinner can be justified is true repentance toward God and saving faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ because it's only through this penitent faith in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus, that the gift of righteousness is imputed, thus ending the war with God and producing peace with God. Listen to this precious verse from Colossians 1 and verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. On the cross of Calvary, God's perfect righteousness in his sinless son, the Lord Jesus, met man's wicked sinfulness and willful selfishness. And listen, the Lord our righteousness won the battle. Reconciliation was made. Atonement for sin was made. And thus the sinner can know peace with God. Are you a born again soldier? You have peace with God. You're no longer an enemy of God. 
You're no longer on opposite sides with God. We have the stability and the security of knowing that God is on our side. We're no longer enemies of God. God now calls you friend if you're born again. God is on your side. And that means he is your defender. Or we could put it this way. I am at one with God through the Prince of Peace. I have peace with God. No wonder Jesus said to those original disciples, peace, I give you my peace. I give to you. What does that do? Well, that equips us to have stability and security. It gives us a confident walk, a stable walk in this hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy of our souls. Because God has brought me from a condition of alienation to a condition of reconciliation. God, the Father who is the God of peace, is now my Father. A God, the Son, who is the Prince of Peace, is now my Prince, my King. Of the Holy Spirit, who imparts that precious peace, has come to abide in me and every born-again believer. So when we know we have peace with God, we can march through this warfare without fear. Amen? We can march in stability. We can march in security. For God, as we just sang about, God's perfect love for me and for you cast out all fear. Now listen to Habakkuk 3.19, or as Brother John used to say, Habakkuk. <laughs> listen to Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3.19. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on my high hills. Remember, we're talking about spiritual warfare. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age. We're wrestling against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. And our enemy is a cunning, crafty enemy. Our enemy is a sinister and deceiving enemy. So we must be on the alert from slipping and falling in the battle. We must be vigilant to make certain that our feet are fixed on a firm foundation. We must be resolute on our stand on the blessed truth that we have peace with God through the blood of the cross. I've been equipped with the boots of the gospel of peace. And this enables you and I to stand strong in the Lord and the power of his might. We don't need to fear the enemy, even God's arch enemy, the devil himself. Because we have a commander who's already won the victory. That's why Paul said, I know in whom I believe. He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And listen, these glorious boots of the gospel of peace are the anchor to our soul that gives you and I stability and security in the warfare. Let the enemy attack and assail as he will, but I will not be moved away from the glorious gospel of peace. It has been deeply implanted in my heart. God called me with a call of grace in 1980.
so that I trusted in Jesus alone, saved by his grace alone. He has already glorified me in my mind. These are, in his mind, these are eternal certainties and securities. As Keith Getty and Stuart Townend have well written, no power of hell, no scheme of man shall ever pluck me from his hand. Uh, this is an incredible indicative concerning what God has done in giving us the boots of the gospel of peace. Oh, but where there are indicatives, there will be imperatives that every soldier must obey in light of this indicative, in light of this promise that we've been given the glorious gospel of peace. That gospel should be inspiring you. It should be energizing you to live a life of unwavering faith in the Prince of Peace and an uncompromising commitment to the Prince of Peace. Uh, these gospel shoes should cause us to energize us to march forward into battle by giving, uh, by expressing a single minded dependence on the Prince of Peace and a single minded devotion to the Prince of Peace. Are you standing firmly against the adversary that would teach, seek to turn you aside? Are you exhibiting a single-minded dependence on the Lord Jesus? A single-minded devotion to the Lord Jesus? Are you resolved as a soldier of the Prince of Peace to carry out His orders in this world? You know, there are many folks who come to church. Uh, they desire the benefits of the gospel. But they're neglecting the duties of the gospel. Oh, they want all the blessed benefits that the gospel of reconciliation can give them, but they're not so excited about obeying the personal responsibilities that the Prince of Peace has given them. Thus, they are slipping and sliding in the combat, both, both morally, both doctrinally. Many of them are not even sure of what they believe, for they don't study to show themselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not resolute and unshakable in their gospel beliefs. They're, they're wavering. They're vacillating. Uh, they're compromising. What about you? Are you courageously standing with a single-minded dependence on the Lord, a single-minded devotion to the Lord? Are you prepared to make an unwielding stand on the gospel of peace, an uncompromising devotion to the Prince of Peace? Are you ready to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, no matter the trials, the troubles, the tribulations? Oh, but brother Ed, I'm in the midst of great adversities, great afflictions. Paul says, listen, these light afflictions are but for a moment. And they're working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The sufferings of this present time are not to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Oh, brothers and sisters, on this Saturday morning, God is looking for a people who will firmly fasten their feet with the boots of the gospel of peace. Amen? Now listen to Peter's exhortation again. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is ceaseless in his wicked strategies to contaminate your walk with the Lord so that you'll become useless in the battle. He's always active and attempting to incapacitate your testimony and put you out of action. 
He is ceaseless in his deceptive schemes. And listen, he's quite willing to use any tactic, even contradict himself. If he can entice you to ruin your testimony for the Prince of Peace. Sometimes he comes as a roaring lion. Sometimes he comes as an angel of light. Sometimes he comes to lure you into legalism. Other times he comes to entice you into licentiousness. But Brother Ed, these are two contradicting extremes. But they both come from the father of lies. And there's only one way to stand in stability and security. It is to shod your feet with the boots of the preparation of the gospel of peace. If we do so, we can march through any adversity, any affliction, we can march through problems, persecutions, even pandemic in victory. <laughs> For what does a brother or sister who is standing in the gospel of peace have to fear? For they know that everything that is occurring in their life is ultimately coming through the sovereign will and the wise providence of their Lord and God who is working all things together of the good and the good is to conform you into the image of the prince of peace so that brother can uh, mount up with wings of eagles <laughs> uh, that sister can run and not be weary walk and not faint because God will keep them in perfect peace if their mind is fixed on the Lord and trust in the Lord. Amen? So that's the first practical application of these boots. Oh, but there's another practical application because the boots of the preparation of the gospel of peace not only give us spiritual stability, they give the soldier spiritual mobility to advance into enemy territory. Now there is one sense in which the boots give us spiritual stability and security to stand against the attacks of the enemy. But to imagine that the soldier of the Lord is only enabled to stand motionless with no possibility of advancing, that would be misguided. Because this Greek word preparation not only gives us the idea of preparation to stand in stability, it gives us the idea that it prepares us to advance in mobility into enemy territory. Listen to Romans 10, verses 14 and 15. Think about the boots of the gospel of peace. Romans 10, how then shall they call on him of whom they've not heard? How shall they believe in him of, excuse me, how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher, without a witness, without a herald? And how shall they preach or herald unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. When this epidemic was initiating, I was in India in the state of Orissa. I was teaching 150 church planters from the state of Orissa. They meet in house churches three or four house churches, they have to meet in secret because there is a law in the state of Orissa that if you're caught witnessing to someone about the gospel, you get two years in prison to begin with. Immediately. You go to prison. If a Hindu testifies of conversion to Christianity in the state of Orissa and the government finds out about it, they go to prison for two years. So we had to have this church planters meeting 
in secret. I was teaching one of the workbooks I have. This particular one is called Christ-Centered Evangelism. You teach it all day for three days with 150 guys packed into this concrete block building with one exit, one door to get out of the room. It was the third day, we were heading up to lunch, and my neuropathy in my feet was burning with an unusual intensity. I didn't tell them, they didn't know it, but I was on fire, <laughs> literally. And during the lunch break, I'd always get at that one door and stand there. Normally, they would shake my hand. But on this day, unbeknowing to what's going on with me in their minds, they walked out one after the other, bowed down to the floor, and kissed my feet and said, quoted, How beautiful are the feet of them who proclaim good news. <laughs> oh, this is the picture. He gives us mobility to invade enemy territory with the gospel. Every Christian soldier is a ministry of reconciliation to extend the message of the Prince of Peace into the hearts of sinners who are at war with God. This is not the first time we hear this word gospel in the immediate context of this letter to the church at Ephesus. Listen to Ephesians 1 and verse 13. In him you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Ephesians 3 and verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And the closing verses right after his teaching on the armor of God Paul is asking for prayer as he's on mission with God as a minister of reconciliation and he says in verse 19 and 20 and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. And he's saying, pray for me, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Oh, brothers and sisters, we too are ambassadors for Christ. And we must not be distracted by the present confusion of what is going on in our country to distract us from our primary mission. We are still called to faithfully declare the gospel to the surrounding culture in which we live. We have no orders from heaven to march with sinners to protest other sinners being sinners. No, we have orders to proclaim the gospel to all the sinners. Some of our Southern Baptist leaders have gotten far off base. They think our calling is to march with sinners protesting other sinners being sinners. How stupid is that? Uh, how ridiculous is that? No, we're to march into the world where all the enemies are and take opportunities and make opportunities to proclaim the message of the gospel of peace to those who are still at enmity with God. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us, he's talking to a church, the ministry of reconciliation. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Amen? 
in the midst of this pandemic a couple of months ago, I think it was, I go to Five Guys. Diane is uh, visiting our family, but I'm teaching on Zoom, teaching into India. But I stopped for lunch. I went to Five Guys to get a hamburger. I was going to take it to go, eat it in the car, and get back to the house. And I'm uh, walking out. I hear the words, Mr. Lacey, I turned around. I looked at this fellow and he said, he said to me, are you Ed Lacey? I said, yes, yes, sir. How can I help you? He said, I've just got to tell you today. You were preaching an extended meeting at the Mission of Hope a couple of years ago. It was a four-day meeting. And he said, in the midst of that meeting, I was converted to Jesus. I was delivered from drugs. My family is restored. I've got a wonderful job in the construction business. He introduced his boss. And he said, by the way, we're constructing a church building right now. We celebrated the grace of God. Listen, brothers and sisters, I didn't give him peace with God. But I was thrilled to hear that I was the minister of reconciliation. When he found peace, with God. God has given us the supreme privilege to announce the message of peace and plead for its acceptance among sinners. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We're not here to protest. We're not here to politic. As a matter of fact, if you're born again, you are a resident alien in the United States of America. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm thankful I wasn't born in the mountains of Afghanistan. I'm thankful I was born in Gulfport, Mississippi in the United States, but this is not my home. Right? Where's my citizenship? Yeah, it's in heaven. I'm a resident alien. And you and I are left here as pilgrims and strangers in this foreign land called the United States of America to proclaim to those around us who are presently under the wrath of God and at enmity with God the message by which they can find peace with God. And may I say as I close these morning sessions that we are debtors to those around us to hear that message. Now, that's what Paul said. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks, to the barbarians, both to the wise, to the unwise, both to the Republicans and to the Democrats, both to the Antifa and everybody else. I am a debtor. I owe those rebels an opportunity to hear about the message of peace from the Prince of Peace so that they might find peace with God. And fellow soldiers, we are under obligation. Are you paying your debts? You certainly don't want to exit this world with a mountain of debt. Can you truthfully testify I am ready to pay that debt for I am not ashamed of the glorious gospel of peace. There is nothing more shameful than a soldier who's guilty of dereliction of duty. A slothful soldier who's dragging his feet. George Whitfield, who was one of the preachers in the Great Awakening in our nation, he said, God forbid that I should travel with someone for 15 minutes without sharing the gospel. David Brainerd, the Presbyterian missionary, said, I care not where or how I live or what hardships I'm called upon to endure just so I gain 
souls for Christ. Charles Spurgeon, the greatest Baptist preacher who walked on this earth, said every professing Christian is either a missionary, that means on mission with God in Navarre, Pensacola, Gulf Breeze. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Are you advancing into the enemy territory? Or are you going through the motions? Are you advancing? Are you progressing with the proclamation of the gospel? Or are you sleepwalking in a lifeless routine? You know, in human warfare, the defeated foe sends an ambassador to plead for peace. But in spiritual warfare, the victorious Lord sends his soldiers as ambassadors to plead with sinners that they might have peace with God. Oh, we've been given some blessed boots, both to stand in stability and security because of the glorious gospel of peace, but also to give us mobility to advance into enemy territory, not through protesting, but through proclaiming the message of reconciliation. Amen? I love you. Thank you for the joy to serve you this morning. I pray you'll come back as we continue to put on our armor for the glory of God.